three great brands up here today um, who have not shied away from tackling social justice issues head on. Um, they'll be telling us today why and how they decided to engage. So I'm super excited to learn more about that. Um, we've got Chris Miller, activism manager at Ben & Jerry's. Some would say the benchmark or the godfathers of purpose. <laughs> and then next to Chris, we have Carleen Pickard, ethical campaign specialist at Lush Fresh Handmade Cosmetics, a brand that's creating a cosmetics revolution to save the planet. And next to Carleen, we have Vikram Ayer, VP of Global Publicity and Strategy at Postmates. And Postmates really helps, to, uh, helps you to get your 2 a.m. burrito delivered and supports your local businesses, so welcome. So before we go into the panel discussion, why don't you take a few minutes to talk a little bit about the, um, the activities you've done in this space. We can start with you first, Vikram. Hey everybody, good morning. Um, first, just as a quick poll, how many of you are familiar with uh, Postmates as a company or have used it before? Okay, good chunk of you. For, for those who haven't used it before, it's an app, kind of like a Lyft, in which instead of getting a ride on demand, um, you, you end up sending a courier, we call them Postmates, to pick up goods locally in your community. Um, and there's an obvious question, right? If you can get burritos delivered on demand late at night, or if you can get uh, Robitussin from a CVS delivered at 2 a.m. on demand, what does that really have to do with uh, advocacy or social impact and purpose? Um, and, and for us, it really comes down to this notion of who we are supporting in a community. So, you know, we all use Amazon, it's hyper convenient, it's not going away, but if you think about the Amazon model, they will build a warehouse on the outskirts of cities and then funnel goods into town, which actually shortchanges your or my interest to go to the hardware store down the road to buy our light bulbs if we can just get it through a click from our laptop. What Postmates does is the inverse of that model. We index the product offerings of your cities. A lot of people use us for prepared foods, but we can get health and wellness products, uh, you can get beauty supplies, you can get goods from a local pharmacy, and then we allow, we plug in those local brick and mortar retailers with the tools they need to distribute those goods. In this case, those tools include our matching algorithm, our actual network of 350,000 Postmates couriers nationwide, and ultimately the a, a, a ability to extend your reach to new customers. But for us as a company, beyond supporting local businesses and local retailers, we actually think about who are making the deliveries. So on the one hand, um, that's actually probably a delivery that I'm getting right now. No, no worries, no worries at all. Um, so on the one hand, when you think about a delivery space, it might just be that. You're getting a good transacted between you, the app, and then the end state of that being delivered to your door. But when we th start thinking about purpose as a company, we start thinking about the ecosystem of the people who are part of that delivery transaction. In this case, you may very well be getting food made at a local taqueria of yours, where that food is prepared back of house by an immigrant, where that food being delivered might be an immigrant student at UT Austin, and where that food is going to somebody that might be a transgender college student at UT Austin. For us, that means that the platform only thrives when we start to stand up for policies of inclusion. Otherwise, people will start to feel held back on the platform. So while on the one hand, we very much care about impacting local retail, there was this incredibly sad story that popped up for us as a company in 2018. This is around the time that the current administration actually started to uh, hint at the fact that it was going to rescind DACA protections for Dreamers. These are the approximately 800,000, uh, we'll call them Americans, who came to this country um, not under legal pretenses but quite young and grew up here and are for everything but the letter of the law Americans. We actually got feedback and emails written into us from our network of couriers asking, hey, can I still operate and deliver on your platform? Can I still earn on your platform? Some of them were asking for themselves. They weren't all dreamers themselves, but many of them were asking for friends and family. Because if any of you have driven for Uber or no friends that work for Lyft or for Postmates, it's a very low barrier to entry to work. It means that you can get on the platform right away, earn right away, and use that to supplement your income. It is not our goal because of the policies of any one administration to prevent anybody from continuing to carry out their lives and earn the way they need to earn to make rent and make do and 
frankly have some dignity. So the first time that we actually engaged in a purpose-driven campaign was when we partnered with the ACLU to start disseminating information to know your rights as an immigrant. Now, basically sending email campaigns off may not be seen as a big deal, but for us as a company, this was the first time we took a forward-facing forward stance on an issue that c directly ran counter to the White House and actually tried to leverage a civil society partner in order to advance that along the way. And since that time, that relationship with the ACLU has only flourished. Actually, right now, the census is being upended by a potential question in which people are being asked their citizenship status. And for a lot of people, that is a huge cause of concern because the more you ask a citizenship test, the fewer respondents you have. The fewer respondents you have encapsulating people that may not be here legally or may not be citizens, the fewer number of heads we know we have in the United States. That changes everything from congressional redistricting lines all the way to when we say at Postmates, we're now arriving in your city. If we don't actually know the city coverage map of how many people are there, our business is actually implicated. So coming from this point of working with the ACLU to advance an issue campaign just on DACA and Dreamers has now advanced us to write, filing legal briefs with the courts on the census. It's actually allowed us to do matching campaigns that I think some of my other colleagues here are gonna talk about as well. And it sort of created this ethos of purpose at the company. And since that point, we've done everything, as you might see on the screen, is partnering with the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, as we have several veterans, both as customers, business owners, and couriers on our platform. We've partnered with MTV and Michelle Obama's When We All Vote to drive voter registration numbers. And we've actually started working with the California Fire Foundation, which last year, as many of you may have seen, wildfires roared across Southern and Northern California. And so we started a partnership with local emergency management services to use our network of couriers, our Postmates, who are otherwise, when they're not making those burrito deliveries, can then route emergency supplies to evacuation shelters. At the end of the day, these are the types of issues that we really care about. And whether it's an immigration matter, transgender bathroom laws, even issues like internet neutrality, we might have a very small voice, but we actually use that voice to shape our social impact. I'll conclude on one final point, and that is our Postmates themselves they are the ones that make our platform possible. They are the ones that make our Sunday, lazy Sunday dreams, with Netflix and chill impossible. But we're very proud that they earn about 18 an hour. That's 153% higher, higher than federal minimum wage. But independent workers in this country, they don't have access to a full suite of benefits. They don't have access to health care, wage protections, not even sexual harassment or discrimination protections apply to independent workers. This isn't just a problem for Postmates. This is a problem for domestic workers, Lyft drivers. So another thing that we're focused on on our public policy side, kind of different from our social impact arm, is advocating for ways in which we can increase access to career development, increase access to health care, and increase access to a debate around the future of work, and that has involved Postmates actually engaging in negotiations with the governors of Washington State, California, and New York, and labor unions to figure out a new social compact of how these kind of gig economy workers can participate into economic certainty and upward mobility in the company. With that, I'll just say that I think for Postmates, it's really important that we recognize as a company that this is not just for good brand purposes or differentiating purposes. We frankly believe that this is the era of the CEO statesman or stateswoman. We see from Patagonia to Salesforce to Apple, CEOs that are actually taking on fights head on, not just with any one government, but on the ideas that they believe in. We have a fairly young CEO, and so for us to do that can be tricky, but I think when you try and stand on the right side of history, you end up finding out that it can work out both for the brand as well as the community that you're seeking to represent. Great, thank you. You want me to yeah. go right ahead there? Okay. Um, <laughs> So good, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Carlene. Super pleased to be here from Lush, and there's a whole bunch of my awesome colleagues here from uh, North America and also from the UK. So really happy uh, to see everyone. We're really happy to be here and have a bunch of cool things going on over the course of the week. So if we don't get to chat now, maybe we will get to chat in the next couple of days. Um, I I'll start. Um, I'll start the way that we're going to start. How many people are familiar with Lush? Okay, so we're good, right? Yes. Thank you. So, um, as a um, um, as a, as a cosmetics company, 
you know, you at any given day sort of walk into our store, you might be buying your shampoo or you might be, um, you know, getting something for after a long day to hang out in your bathtub and make it smell beautiful and fresh and feel fantastic. Um, we also all year around, all year round have um, this hand and body lotion in the store, which is called Charity Pot. And so for my work, I primarily sit on the team that does our charitable giving. So I'm just going to go straight to talk about what Charity Pot does. Um, it's hand and body lotion, and 100% of what the customer pays for that goes directly into our charitable giving fund, which is also conveniently called Charity Pot. Um, and so grassroots organizations from around the world can apply uh, for a grant from the Charity Pot Fund. And, you know, we um, keep, have sort of intentionally kept the charitable giving within the business and not created an external foundation so that we have a little bit more leeway in terms of the types of organizations that we can grant out to. So there are small grassroots organizations, um, budgets of under 500K, but the areas that we fund are the kind of big, broad ranging animal rights, human rights, and the environment. So we've really enjoyed over the last 10 years, um, and I'll just put a slide up here, of the last, the last few years, but over the last 10 years since we've had Charity Pot in the store, really watching it grow um, in terms of the trust that customers are putting in us to give us their money so that we can take 100% of that and get that back out and working in the community. Um, but also really watched our partnerships with organizations grow over the years. So we talk about our partnerships um, with the groups that you'll see they're sort of featured on the labels in the stores. You know, we'll talk about our partnership as much more than just a granting partnership, but something that we're always looking to figure out. Is there more that we can do? You know, are there sort of events that they might need coverage of. You know, Sabine's here from the social team. We're always talking about, you know, a bigger initiatives that some of our partners have and how um, we can push those out using our social, um, using our platforms to do that as well. And so over the last couple of years that we have really developed and dug into what we call our ethical campaigns, and that's a way to continue to lift the voice of our partners. And so from time to time, if you go into a store, um, when we're not talking about Mother's Day or Valentine's Day or Christmas, um, we talk about issues that are important to us as the business and issues that we think are important to the community. So, you know, again, we've kind of wa we've worked on issues around climate justice. Uh, core to our brand is fighting animal testing. So continuing to get legislation to ban animal testing for cosmetics around the world. Um, we talk about animal protection and banning trophy hunting of grizzly bears, and then most recently had a campaign last year which talked about trans rights. So the campaign though, I was gonna dig into a little bit um, with this time just because it's when it's listed in the, in the write-up for today. But um, in 2017, we took a pretty firm stance as North America calling for the abolition of the death penalty in the United States. And, um, you know, I think when we were talking about this session, it was like, let's talk about your controversial campaigns. You know, I think people definitely get upset when we talk about keeping fossil fuels in the ground. Um, I think Ben and Jerry's knows about this as well. But really digging, you know, going and taking a stand on the problems around criminal justice and the death penalty was something that I try to not say it's controversial. I try to just say it was, you know, it was tough. It's a tough issue. And um, we really learned a lot out of it as the company. So... Yeah, so again, that was in 2017. Um, I just put up a couple of the, the media um, that we got around the campaign, because I think you know, a lot of people sort of say, oh, the death penalty. But then you know, actually seeing it play out in the way that that campaign was out for about 14 days in our stores, um, you, know, you actually saw people really coming around to having a conversation about something that had been tough, or you know, sounds like it's tough to talk about. But we used, you know, three really pragmatic arguments about how the death penalty isn't making our community safer, how it doesn't address the root cause of crime, and isn't applied fairly across the United States. And then we also kind of went for that emotional punch and really talked about folks that are exonerated, so people that were falsely accused of committing a crime and spent time on death row. And, I mean, we know people were executed when they were innocent of the crime they were committed. So... Um, you know, really having those conversations with people and bringing people around to understanding why we as the brand were calling for the abolition. Um, so just uh, things that are interesting or come up when we talk about this campaign 
are the impact that we had on staff. So, you know, we've got about 8,500 staff across North America who all really dug into this. They do the work every day standing on the shop floor talking to customers about our position and our stance. So, for me, even that as like an organizer is an incredible position to just get to talk to those people and get those people to really come around. Um, and then, you know, just on our social channels, I put this up too because I know we're talking later about controversy and, um, you know, or backlash, more to say. So, you know, we did have a real mixed result in terms of some people who really thought differently um, than we did as the brand, but then, you know, also some people who did, um, who did have a think and, and thought about um, the messages that we were putting out. So that was yeah. my introduction. Um, oh, wait, yeah, sorry, quickly, I was just going to say our ongoing work, too. So the campaigns, you know, they'll run in stores for um, 10 days or two weeks, and then, you know, in the back end as the brand, we're still very much working on the issue. So recently, before Governor Brown left office, you know, calling for him to commute um, everyone that was on death row. Um, California holds one third of the entire population of folks who are on death row in the United States, continuing to fund those partners through Charity Pot, and then really looking for ways that we as the business can um, continue to advocate sort of using that brand. So I was just in Brussels talking to the European Parliament about uh, this soap company, you know, this soap company that um, called for the abolition in the United States, and they find it a real interesting way to get advocacy and education out around abolition. So thank you, and looking forward to talking about that later. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Miller. I work for Ben & Jerry's. We make ice cream. Who's, who's heard of Ben & Jerry's? <laughs> All right. So it's great to be here, uh, and it's wonderful to be here with Vikram and Carleen, uh, two great companies doing great work. Uh, Postmates, you know, thank you for delivering half-baked to our fans at 2 in the morning. Um, I, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, our approach to activism, and specifically as it relates to the Trump era, because it's sort of a whole new world, isn't it? Um, w w some of you may know, and in fact, only, you know, we've been doing this kind of issue advocacy and activism work for 40 years. It is sort of baked into the DNA of the company, and that is because you know, we have two hippie founders that, that you know, sort of were activists themselves. And in fact, they sort of, three years into the business, they, they sort of so despised what they had become business people that they almost sold the company. Uh, and, and it was a mentor of Ben's who said, if you don't like the way business is done, change the way you run your business. And that was really sort of an aha moment for Ben. But we've been doing this for a while, right? And, and um, it, 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 the age of Trump is really different now, and, and I think uh, for a couple of reasons. I think, right, the country seems so incredibly polarized. I don't actually think it is, but it, but it feels like it is. And it feels dangerous, I think, to kind of step into these kind of issue areas, whether you're having a conversation at the Thanksgiving dinner table or you're taking a stand as a company. Um, we sort of waded into this literally the day after the election, our, uh, and you know, Carlene has an incredible asset at Lush, which is the company stores and the teams that work at the company stores to push these campaigns out. We have a franchised network, so they're not Ben & Jerry's employees. So our campaigns, we lean much more heavily on digital and social channels. We've got an incredibly passionate uh, group of, of fans, consumers that follow us on our digital and social channels, and we built this kind of capacity to develop content and, and, and publishing to support the campaign work we do. But the, it, we wanted to post an open letter to the president-elect. Everyone assumed it was going to be Clinton. We had this beautiful sort of piece of content, open letter to President-elect Clinton celebrating the smashing of the biggest glass ceiling. And, you know, at whatever time it was, 1.30, we thought, oh, shit, we got to rewrite this thing. <laughs> so so we, got, we got to work right away, and, and we put this up, and, and it was the day after the election. And, you know, basically what we said is, and I'll read a little bit, we said, we stand ready to defend the progress that our country has made on climate change. We will continue to be strong advocates for racial and social justice, LGBTQ rights, gender equity, respect for religious differences, and opportunity for all. We stand with women, people of color, Muslims, migrants, refugees, the LGBT community, the poor, and others whose lives may be further compromised by the policies and rhetoric you espouse during your campaign. And 
We commit to stand with you if your work is towards building a more just, equitable, and sustainable world. We now know that wasn't true, but uh, anyway, we were at least giving him the benefit of the doubt at the time. And we've sort of weighed in on issues over the course of the last two and a bit years. We, we had a, a strong piece on the Muslim ban, and then one of the h highest performing pieces of content we've had over the last two years was sort of a mocking article uh, with the top 10 reasons pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement was a good idea. Um, so, but we've kind of leaned into this understanding that, that it, 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 it is controversial. Probably the most controversial thing we've done over the last couple of years, but we felt that it was important to do, was to actually release a flavor. So now, this, this is a flavor called Pecan Resist. This is Fabiana Rodriguez. She is an incredibly awesome uh, activist, artist uh, from the Bay Area, and uh, it is an incredibly beautiful pack. We had never sort of done something like this before, um, uh, something that look, was, was sort of much more unconventional than our, our typical packaging. Um, but we felt like in the run-up to the midterm election, it, it, it was clear sort of who this guy was and that the, the, the sort of normalization of uh, uh, the destructiveness of the political process, anti-media, attacking all of the things we hold so dear as a company, we had to take a stand, and, and we did it uh, uh, with the sort of loudest voice that we have, and that's a, a ice cream flavor. Um, not surprisingly, nothing generates more buzz and interest and focus on something than when we launch a new flavor. Um, so, uh, we went to D.C., we went to the National Press Club a week before the midterm election and launched this flavor that specifically called out the Trump administration on the pack. The, the sort of romance copy on the back said, welcome to, to the resistance together, pecan resist. We honor and stand with women, immigrants, people of color, and the millions of activists and allies who are courageously resisting the president's attack on our values, humanity, and environment. We celebrate the diversity of our glorious nation, raise our spoons in solidarity for all Americans, and encourage people to go to a URL and take action with four uh, uh, not-for-profit partners that we had that included Color to Change, Women's March, and a couple of others. Uh, so we've leaned in heavily. It was controversial. Uh, uh, I spent days on the phone um, with our consumer affairs team listening to angry people yelling uh, at how we were disrespecting our president. But. Um, but, you know, I think it, it, it put our company on record, which is what we were interested in, in doing, and it generated a lot of support for our four partners. I want to quickly tell you that despite this controversy, and this is a part of the presentation where I always feel a little icky, um, I am not a business guy. Uh, my background is in, in policy and advocacy. I spent half a dozen years leading the climate team at Greenpeace, so I don't have an MBA. I'm not a business guy, but I'm going to show you that when you do this right, when you take a stand for something that's deeply rooted in your values, it actually is not a bad thing for the business. So uh, this is a piece of content that we, we put together. We, we tested probably 30 different pieces of creative across five different platforms, digital platforms, uh, in the run-up to COP21, Paris, right? Binding, hope was to get a binding global agreement on climate. And we tested all this content. This is the piece of content, and, and the idea was to drive people to take an action with our partners of Oz. We wanted to present a million signatures to world leaders on the first day of COP21. So this was the piece of content that performed best. Uh, and uh, what you will see, it's, it's really hard to read, uh, at least where I am, but we uh, uh, generated, we put a sizable media spend behind it, um, almost 360,000 petition signatures on this. You'll see at the bottom of the sort of or midway on the right side, it, it had a three to one ROI. So we put a sizable media spend behind it. It had a three to one ROI on short term sales, which is better than, a, a little bit better than our average piece of creative. So we did better than just a straight up, you know, sort of what we call ice cream porn shot of, you know, a delicious cup of chocolate fudge brownie. Um, the other thing it did is it, it, it led to a measurable increase in consumer loyalty. So over on the, the top half, the right side, people who saw that previous ad, and what I'll note is, right, there's no ice cream here. If you didn't see that we posted it, 
you, you wouldn't know it was a Ben and Jerry's ad, right? The whole thing's about driving people to take this action and become supporters of Avaz and sign the petition. Um, so it led to a 11 point lift in folks who attributed the term environmentally and socially responsible to our brand. So, and then the bottom half shows that for people who endorse those terms with us, they are more than two times more loyal as consumers, right? So, so this is the icky part. We do not do this for this. But the important thing to know is that, that doing this doesn't hurt your business. And, and it's our point of view, really, that to build a strong business and to do this work, we, we, we want to be intensely loved by some people and not inoffensive to everybody. And that's sort of kind of the, the, our approach that we take on this stuff. So I think that is my slides. And Thanks. with that. So then, Chris, just going back to the fact that you mentioned there's, it's a whole new world out there. Do you think then since November 2016, the bar has now been set higher? For those companies wanted to make an impact. Yeah, it's it. It seems like the volume of all of this discourse has risen so high, right? And so, so it it does feel like it takes more to kind of lean in on these things, and that it it's particular uh, potentially fraught with more peril. I mean, if you think about our pecan resist flavor, I mean, the idea that we would have. You know, we've taken a position on a whole host of issues. We've run campaigns, sustained campaigns with partners on controversial issues in the past. We've never had a flavor that specifically went at the leader of the free world, right? It, I mean, so that uh, you think about what Patagonia did, right, in suing the Trump administration over Bears Ears. So it does feel like, in some ways, the kind of cost of entry has, has sort of risen a bit. But, but I think... I don't know. I, I think that's an, oppor an opportunity. I think brands like ours have deeply loyal, passionate fans, and, and I think finding ways for them to connect on these issues and specifically figure out ways to sort of take action and support people who are advancing right, these issues is, is kind of the opportunity here. That's interesting you say that because, Colleen, I'm going to come to you next. Do you think it's the brands then leading the consumers or the consumers leading the brands, or it's a bit of both? Right. Um, well, I think that I, I, the first thing that I was going to say before that, and just from the end of what Chris is saying, is also to remember that it's not the brands that are like inventing dissent, right? Like there are all these organizations that have been doing this work for so long, and they think brands get this giant pat on the back for sort of being brave and coming in and saying something, whereas there's so many organizations that have just been on the vanguard of calling out what's going on for so long. So the, I always think the opportunity that we have is to be able to take that great work and to put it out there in the world in a new way. So for us, it's in our windows and then through all of our staff. Um, you know, I think everyone, each folks have spoke to both the ways that they get it out. So I think, I mean, I th so that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing on that is that, you know, I think there's your part of Novelli research that talks about um, how the, you know, how folks are kind of demanding more of the brands yeah. these days. And so, you know, when I first looked at that, I think that's, it's interesting because there should be this fire kind of lit under brands, but not to think you're somehow inventing this idea that there's dissent out there, but to take what's already been generated for so long, for so many decades, and figure out how to uplift that and get that out to consumers in a meaningful way, which also means for me, and certainly the work that that we try to do at Lush is to, is to get people to take action in a meaningful way, not just in a name capture way or a sell more stuff way, but you know, step outside what you're trying to you know, what, what you're achieving is the brand by selling whatever it is you're selling, but that you're adding into a movement. You know, I think whenever we look at doing any of our campaigns in stores or issues that we want to engage on, it's always, my thing is like, how are we leaving this movement stronger than it was before we ever engaged on that issue? Can I, can I add to that? I, I feel like the, the another way that we examine this is how can we leverage the unique superpower of our product in a way that is not just like, 
another voice in the course of history, which is an important voice to add, but something that's a little bit unique, a little bit more germane to the way you do business. Um, you know, we obviously have a marketplace and an offer delivery, and so the fact that we can move goods around quite readily is an important way in which we think about the world on the app that they see at the end of the day um, that says, hey, there's no more Postmates orders coming in, but um, if you have leftover food, let us know. And then we use our couriers, uh, a network of couriers to pick up food and then route it to local homeless shelters in, in um, partnership with the, the mayor's office in, in each of those cities so that way they have an understanding of what the right targeted shelters should be. And I think that's a scenario in which we can ask ourselves, okay, food security is a challenge. Should we just donate to Meals on Wheels or is there a unique way that we can come up with a novel practice? And I think if you start thinking about it through that lens as well, it creates like a whole new range of opportunities for a company to lean in. And then these all sound like great initiatives. Vikram, have you ever kind of experienced any sort of backlash from consumers, from employees when it comes to kind of navigating this minefield? It's interesting. I think the big, well, first, kind of kind of like Chris, I, I don't have a business background. I, I come from government, um, worked in the last administration. So sometimes I feel a little nervous when I take these ideas to our CEO or CFO. They're like, oh, you're just another suit from Washington trying to push an idea forward. But I think um, once you start to socialize internally to your company, the value of doing this and the, the importance of, of baking this ethos into your DNA in hopes of getting to a Ben and Jerry's like posture where it's just, you know, core to how you do business. Um, when you take a look at the online engagement, uh, the best way for us to measure that um, tends to be through social channels as well. You do see a lot of pushback on uh, from, from cu customers from our, across the globe, frankly. Um, you know, we'll get commentary that just outright disagrees with our position, all the way to just more neutral commentary saying, just bring me my food, bro. I don't need you to take a stance yeah. on X or Y. Um, but when you measure that, kind of akin to the chart that, that was laid out a moment ago, when you measure that against customer sales and consumer sales and consumer interest, I mean, let's call a spade a spade. Even though I get to work on cool policy issues for the company, we are trafficking in laziness as a product, right? And so insofar as that laziness ceiling gets pierced through by a social justice issue, from our perspective, we've actually done something good because we've animated the mindset of somebody so much to get them thinking about an issue that they're turning away. And I think that's the, night, the right outcome we would want in, in terms of starting a conversation. At the end of the day, though, and I don't say this flippantly, you know, ours is a company that's about to go public this year. And so I think that that consumer growth, even though we've been baking in these advocacy stances for the last two or three years, has not... Um, uh, has left the consumer sales fairly unfettered from our perspective. So are you going to be more or less careful now on coming out into issues, seeing as you're going to do an IPO? Are you going to be afraid of kind of offending any sort of investor base? That's a really good question. Um, the short answer is I'm not sure. And I think that's the exciting part for anyone that works at small companies where your brand is not a household name. A lot of this is done through experimentation. I fear that when I first started at the company and tried to start a, C a social impact arm, you know, I was talking to colleagues at Lyft, at Levi's, at, at companies that have had incredible track records doing this for quite some time, always wanting to model and mimic where their head is at. Um, but then you realize CSR does not, or social impact or advocacy does not have to play across a certain playbook. You don't necessarily have to do it in a certain way. And I think, A, you need to be comfortable experimenting and realizing that if something fails or it doesn't go well, you can recalibrate and regroup. But B, you know, in terms of Silicon Valley investors, ours is a company that has received funds from a very prominent venture capital fund known as Founders Fund, who has a lead partner investor named Peter Thiel. And Peter Thiel took a lot of, um, you know, headwinds from the community in the Bay Area when he came out uh, uh, voraciously supporting Donald Trump. And so I think if we were to trip over who we stood for, what we stood by, simply based off of investor base, I don't think we would have a robust marketplace of ideas. So hopefully we will continue to, to maintain that robust commitment to just a, a perseverance of, of wanting to be on the right side of history. Yeah. It's about being authentic at the end of the day and true to your values. Absolutely. And then, Colleen, how do you kind of... Uh, um, how do you... Um, kind of ensure that brands should go about doing this sort of stuff without being accused of riding the anti-Trump bandwagon? Well, I, I mean, we, what's interesting, I, I think, about Lush is that we've been doing these, we've been doing campaigns like this for, you know, I think eight to ten years um, in our stores and sort of in 
increasingly more on increasingly more and more issues um but that it's not as kind of universally known you know like if you're not a lush shopper you might not know that you know that we've talked a lot about refugees coming from Syria and the importance to the importance of welcoming them and also you know pretty consistently taken a stance against the tar sands in northern Alberta um, and the impact that that has on climate change so for us that's always been and you know this certainly comes from our founders in the UK you know we've always been a campaigning company we didn't have to sit down and figure out you know, okay, now what are our values? I mean, we've we've always consistently sort of known it's always been core to who we are as the brand that we want to campaign. Um, but that it, on that, you know, the kind of question around controversy, like it is not 100% that people come into the store who are buying their soap and shampoo that necessarily know that someone's going to talk to them um, about our stance on the death penalty. So it's something that's always, it's always interesting to watch when we do... Um, when we do posts on social, because you'll see people saying, you know, who is this? I'm never shopping here again. And then you'll also have that pretty consistently follow up with great more for me. And if you didn't know this, you obviously aren't a loyal customer. So um, the piece of, I mean, I think the thing around, I just feel, and I know we talked about this earlier, but, you know, I just feel strongly that brands right now can't just say, oh, we want to be anti-Trump because it seems like it's trendy. I think really looking at brands that, you know, have some sort of either social justice or, you know, core component of purpose is is important in that just kind of hiring in a facilitator to put some butcher pieces of paper up on the wall isn't going to help you get to exactly what that is. I think we know the brands that, you know, care beyond consumerism and capitalism um, and want to take a stand on issues and I think for companies that think they're going to start doing that again it's just really important to look to the organizations that have been doing the work for so long and figure out how you're actually lifting up their voices and not just coming out with some great stand that you just invented and Chris do you think November 2016 unleashed something that's here to stay or do you think things will get more tapered if a more suitable person yeah. wins in 2020? I sure the hell hope not. I, <laughs> I mean, I hope the genie goes back in the bottle. Um, and I, I am optimistic about it. I mean, I, I think, you know, and I think it's important for companies to call bullshit on what's happening. It, 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 the... The political climate now and the normalization of hate and, and racism and anti-Semitism and anti-media and are, are undermining the very nature of our democracy, right? And that is, that's not only bad for me as a citizen, that's bad for us as businesses, that's bad for the American economy, we're the laughingstock of the world. And so I think as iconic brands and companies, you know, and to Carlene's point, it's not just about, you know, calling bullshit because it's trendy, but, but, you know, we all have a stake and an interest in, you know, creating a future that is not the dystopian future that Trump sees. And, and so I, I, I am hopeful that, that this too shall pass. And, and I do think it is important uh, for companies to stand up for the institutions and the democratic process and to defend voting rights. And, you know, we, for better or for worse, and I'll admit more often than not, it, it, it can be for worse, businesses are the most powerful entity in society, right? It used to be the church, and it was the nation state, and today it is the global multinational corporation, right? And so that that is that is... You know, that's great responsibility, and I think this is the moment when, when people need to lean in. And can I make one just one quick other point about, uh, as, I, as sort of you mentioned your background, I think what's interesting is that three companies here that are doing this well have put people who are not business people in charge of doing this, and I think that that is an incredibly important part of the success here. That's how you avoid this sort of Pepsi, Kendall Jenner moment. This is, this is, this is not a marketing exercise. Right. This this is an exercise in using our businesses and the relationships we have with our fans and consumers and employees to advance. You know, from Ben and Jerry's, I would say progressive social change. Right. This and, and so having people who come from that world sort of lead the work within the context of the private not for profit corporation, I think, is the, the one of the critical 
uh, components that you have to have if you're going to do this right. And, and the, the notion of businesses, it's, it's a really interesting point because I, I came from, you know, the opportunity to work for the last president was a hell of an opportunity. And I have a friend, KJ, in the back of the room who's also worked in Congress and been able to enact sweeping change from the perch of public office. And when I left, and this was my first job in the private sector, a tech company at that, I kind of had my doubts as to what the impact would be going from, you know, Barack Obama to burrito delivery doesn't exactly seem like the most <laughs> interesting pivot. But I think the other component is that almost every company today is a digital company because you have digital real estate, whether it's through social media channels or an online presence, which means that you can scale a sheet, the, sh the sheer tonnage of eyeballs that you can scale across in a quick moment is so astronomical that it means that every company's megaphone is infinitely louder than even the megaphone of the White House because the White House is only ta tacking on two audiences, the traveling press corps and or whoever t happens to be a political observer that tunes in. Now you're ga capturing consumer media, non-consumer media, um, and I think that that means that authenticity or not, whether you do it because it's a brand campaign or because it's really in your bones to advance an outcome, um, companies really do have the ability to use and wield a megaphone. The question is, how are you gonna wield that power and wield that tool? And I think on balance, if you do it for good, you'll, you'll leave your work at the end of the day feeling a little better off in the same way that the customers, I think, in their purchasing power will feel equally better off. Great, and Carleen, did you want to add anything on that? At all? I also do not have an MBA. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I mean, I you know spent 20 years in nonprofits, and so I think at that period of time, it was um, you know we were constantly thinking like how do you, you know, like how do you get to that other audience? How do you get outside of the people who already know what you're doing, who are already you know so literate on the problems with banks, and who you know have all sorts of extreme um, measures in their lives to make sure that they're not impacting climate change? How do you kind of get to that next level of people? So, you know, it's an incredible opportunity, I think, for me to be able to come, and again, you know, as I said at the beginning, like even just this, our staff, to be able to talk to staff about the kinds of change that, um, that we wanted to talk about as a business, but then yeah, I mean, I'm serious about the millions of customers that come through our door, but I've often said, like, customers, we damn, like, this, these, these thousands of people that we get to speak to directly that work for us and that get to see the place where they go every day speaking what they want to see spoken um, is just an incredible opportunity. So I think, like you said, for good. Great. Thank you very much. We've got about 15 minutes left, so I really want to open it up to questions. And they, and as a point, Las Vegas has odds now in favor of Trump winning 2020. So the question here is a lot of your folks, I don't know if they're franchises, or how are you reaching these parts of the country that elected? I, I think, I actually think, as I alluded to a little while ago, I don't think we're as polarized as we think we are. You know, when, when you look at the, the recent polling around the Green New Deal, right, it polls at 70 plus percent. When you look at AOC's proposal for marginal income tax rate of 70 percent at $10 million, it, it, majorities of Democrats, Republicans, independents. Again, health care for every, like, I think on issues. And the point is that today, you know, our president now doesn't, sort of talk about issues. He talks about people and he demonizes people and he tries to scare people. So I think what we need to do to break through to those people in the Midwest, in the quote flyover states, right, in Trump country, is to speak to them about the issues that that are impacting their lives. And I think, you know, I think we try and 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 do that. I think admittedly our business over indexes on the coasts, right? We we have a lot more a lot more franchisees and scoop shops on the east and west coast than we do in Kansas and and, and Nebraska. I, and I would add, I think you make a tremendous point, right? There are 63 million voters or so that voted in this president, and particularly being a tech company, which is based in, in San Francisco, the short answer is I think we ought to do better. Um, our company started in the urban core, 
um, in cities like Miami or Phoenix or, or New York. And now as we've grown and scaled, we're starting to move out into suburban and more rural parts of the country. We're now in about 550 US cities. And, and a third of that expansion happened within the last year. And most of that is within the flyover as well. So I think part of it is us socializing our product first and seeing what the value add is that a product like Postmates can help local retail extend the reach to new customers. Um, but I, I do fear, feel, and I'm just thinking out loud with you right now, I do fear that if we start to take stances that are seen as stances we genuinely believe in and that our stances are for genuine public policy and for good, that because of the fact that the messenger of that stance happens to be a coastally based tech company at this moment in history of what tech means, that we all get typecast as just being anti-Trump. And I think that your question is a good responsibility for us, particularly since we are new to this game uh, of social advocacy and social justice, to figure out how we're doing so in a real meaningful way. Otherwise, we not only risk losing business, more importantly, I think we risk fueling that divide. Yeah, so I just add, you know, when we run our campaigns, we you know, overwhelmingly will run them in the 250 stores that we have. So 200 of those are in the United States and they're not, you know, there's not a ton of them kind of in that middle, but there are, there are some. Um, and the way that, you know, what I would say though, the, the way that, that the campaigns sort of show up or express themselves like on the shop floor is very much in a conversation way. And so again, like this power of all these staff who are just trained to have conversations with people, um, that you do find that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, so if you look stuff on social, people will be much more harsh, of course, we all know this, but, you know, in the store, when they've been, if they've been going to a Lush store for a while, and then they all of a sudden, you, you know, or they happen to walk in when we're talking about fossil fuel extraction in a, in a place that relies more heavily on fossil fuel extraction, Alberta is the example for us in Canada, um, but they really have those conversations, and they don't always agree, and they don't always, you know, meet or change the hearts and minds, but it's that way, I think, that we're able to use what we have um, to be able to just have conversations with folks. And, and you know, some people that'll come into their local stores, they kind of won't even know that it's a big company. They'll think, you know, that Lush exists as that like one place in that one mall that they go to. So, um, you know, so the fact that, the, that our staff can, can really tailor the message to the local situation is also, I think, a huge benefit to have a conversation. Thank you, any more questions? So, um, you know, so the fact that the that our staff can can really tailor the message to the local situation is also, I think, a huge benefit to have a conversation. Thank you. Any more questions? You know, how how has it changed specifically in the Trump era? Uh, because it seems to me like you guys would be doing what you're doing regardless of of the era and have been doing it regardless of the era. Rick, would you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll say this, uh, maybe it's a little easier for us because we're a newer company, we're about six years old, but um, it has changed because prior to uh, the Muslim ban, our, our company had never spoken out vocally on an issue. Um, our CEO is an immigrant himself, but I think, as I mentioned kind of at the top, the fact that you can have goods delivered, prepared by an immigrant, delivered by an immigrant, means that we've started to feel that our marketplace could be under attack if policies of inclusivity were under attack. And you may be right, it may have just been that moment in time, maybe the CEO is hyper-caffeinated and said, you know what, I'm putting out a statement on this. But I, I think something is materially different, and I think Chris pointed it out well, which is that it is fueling and stoking division above fueling and advancing good public policy or distinct public policy. I think if we had an administration that was completely focused on, you know what, we think that H-1B visa should be reformed in the following way, or we actually believe nuclear energy or this form of energy is the better way to go, and here's some data behind that, I, I do think that we would have a very, very different conversation vis-a-vis -vis the policies of this administration. But because the policies are delivered by a messenger that tends to be such a blowhard, it creates this massive angst and reaction from from the private sector because the private sector is being trafficked by the people that feel that reaction as well. But I th do think it circles back to the question you asked, which is, will this change under the guise of another administration? And I think that now the imprint has been put on America, American businesses and the American private sector such that maybe companies, if the messenger in the future is a little bit more subtle, a little bit more graceful, that there won't be a need to have a knee-jerk reaction every time there's an overture from the administration. But 
if there's a policy that undercuts something that the business stands for or frankly is necessary for the business to thrive, I think we're gonna continue seeing that more and more. So if there's a silver lining to this administration, it's that we woke up. Do you think it's about the erosion of trust in government, and maybe not only over the last few years, but maybe over the last decade or so, or maybe even the frustration, or combined with the frustration that government hasn't been that active when it has come to tackling some of the greatest issues facing our planet or facing our country? Well, I know for us, um, we put a lot of value in listening to our staff, and so, you know, quite frequently we'll go out and ask staff, like, what is the next issue that, that they think we should talk about? And I think since 2016, 2017, like that's definite, the, the issues that they're writing down are the issues that they're saying they want us to talk about are much more the issues of the day. Um, so people are still very concerned about bees and the collapse of the bees. <laughs> that's been a long, consistent one. Um, but you know, but staff are definitely asking us to talk more about um, the crisis at the border, about family separations, about um, gun policy in the United States. So I think that's changed and pushed us a little bit to your question. Um, to really think more about not just kind of knee-jerk reactions to the day-to-day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day -to -day that's coming out, but, um, you know, in also in 2017, the folks in the U in Lush UK added to our kind of our We Believe statement, our mission statement, that we believe in the freedom movement of all people across the world. And that was, you know, in the wake of Brexit um, in the UK in the kind of European context. But, you know, having that for us has also meant that just sort of embodying that we believe statement and is the time in the United States to be talking about freedom of movement. So I think that has also that, you know, the timeliness of that, but definitely what our staff want. Those issues have become much more the issues of the day they want us to talk about. Just briefly on the point, I think for us, what has changed so dramatically is, you know, there is this long moral arc of the universe, right? And, and that for decades, our nation, uh, it may have been a bit herky-jerky, but we have been making progress on issues of race, on LGBTQ rights, right? On, on immigrant, you know, all of these issues, the environment, we have made progress. And now we have a guy who wants to go back, right? His slogan is make America great again. He wants to go back to this, you know, past that probably never existed, right? And so, so, so all of us so often are, are, are defending attacks on these values, right? It's, it's the DACA, it's the Muslim ban, right? It's, it's the rollback of environmental regulations. And I think in the past, a lot of our work has been focused within a normal policy agenda of making incremental progress over time. And so I think for me, that's what feels kind of so nuts about this time. Yep. Um, in the denim shirt. Hi. <clears throat> Thanks. My name is Lisa. I run a national nonprofit that deals with gender. And I'm curious, from your perspective, we've had partners, Miley Cyrus's Happy Hippie Foundation, Apple, that when they partnered with us, they held us up as an organization. And and that was as powerful, frankly, as the money that they contributed to us. Mm -hmm. That has also not been true mm -hmm. in a couple partners we've had. And again, I'm thankful for the money because it helps us do our work. But it made a big difference that that was a lost opportunity because they have global impact. So I'm wondering how you see the promotion of the organizations you partner with as part of the equation in your CSR. Sure. Um, yeah, I would love to tell you a great story later about Mara Kiesling from the National Center for Trans Equality um, because she definitely spoke to that when we first um, met with them to see if they would partner with us as our national partners in the U.S. on our trans rights campaign. And she had talked about being approached by other brands and kind of the, like, the brands explaining to them what they would kind of get out of the partnership. Um, so we, we very much take from the very beginning of when we do our campaigns, we'll take what is it that our national partner needs done. Um, and that can go anywhere from money to awareness to sign a petition to a name capture to support all of our allies in this. So every way that we craft um, one of our campaigns is, to, is different and, and led by the partner. And then the way that um, the way that it shows up, you know, very much the staff are all talking about the partnerships because, and, and talking about it because 
you know, and actively saying, like, you'll see this in our stores for 10 days or two weeks, but these are the groups that are doing the work in the long run. These are the ones that you need to connect with if you are connected on this issue. We're not like Lush that's going to forever, you know, keep emailing you um, about this particular issue. So I think it's, um, you know, my experience also as a non in nonprofit is that it is unique. Um, but I know that for being on this side of it for Lush, it also just makes them incredibly stronger because it's not us coming up with what we think we should do. I would just say real quickly, I, I think that is exactly right. I, I think for us, putting the partners at the center of the work is what we do. To Carlene's point, we're not the smart issue people. We want to work with partners who are the issue experts that have the strategies to win on these issues, and that we want to help our fans become supporters of that group. So we, we see ourselves as an on-ramp, a pass-through, through which our sort of gen pop fan base can become active supporters of the groups we're partnering with on the issues. That's the value we bring to a relationship, not a little bit of cash, I think. Great, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, so it seems like this is a part of your corporate DNA, right? What would you say to companies are the essential ingredients if it's not a part of their corporate DNA and they're trying to move into the space, um, both from a stakeholder standpoint and an external communication standpoint? Yeah, I can try that. Um, one, it, it sort of requires, you know, you pointed out, Chris, that um, all of us don't have business backgrounds sure my mother does not love me for that. But I think part of it is like, can you anoint a, a, a change maker or a set of change makers within the company, right? And if you don't have a designated policy person or an impact person or a CSR person, then can there be like an employee resource group, for example, that bands together to start to say, what are the issues that we want to tackle? I think once you have that team assembled, even if it's a team of one, then you kind of just need to start for lack of a better term, be annoying about it internally. I think that the first time that, like the luxury of working at a startup is that sometimes um, you don't have to, you can get things through without a lot of approval processes, um, but the, the downside of working at a bigger company is that you have those approval prop uh, processes um, as well. I think though that if you start to make the case internally across key stakeholders, whether that's your communications team, your legal team, maybe it's your C-suite itself, um, there is a certain nudge that most companies will start to feel when their employees and their colleagues are starting to make the case for a, an appropriate outcome. I think we can look, no, these are obviously much bigger companies, but of late we've seen attacks on Microsoft for its use of facial recognition software, Google employees going after um, their own CEO based off of the handling of executives that were involved in alleged think Me Too conduct. And that is a very, very powerful statement. I don't think that that means that the employee team within the company needs to be like a guerrilla warfare like entity. But it means that if you start knocking on the door of those stakeholders that can make that decision, you make a case for a program and then you end up being able to start, uh, you know, suggesting that you will take the time, the energy to enact it, you'll see far greater change than you may want to believe. There's one friend of mine who is a, an attorney at a payments company called Stripe, and she's right now trying to start up her own CSR team, and it's not her day job, and all she did was put together a plan. She mapped it all out, and she socialized it for about the better half of a year, and eventually someone paid attention, and now she has the, you know, the resources and the mandate to build that up. That's obviously one example, and they're not always going to be easy, depending on the value or perp the need of the state of the company, but I do think it starts with some internal change agents simply trying. Um, another final question. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think companies like yourselves are at risk of potentially alienating certain candidates that may have um, viewpoints that are slightly different or counter to what um, you're taking stands on? I'll just very briefly say I we believe very strongly that our the work that we do is a is a important and profound motivator for our employees. If you ask anyone why they're at Ben and Jerry's, they I guarantee you they won't say chunky monkey. They'll say it's because of the social mission of the company. So, uh, you know, I think in terms of kind of hiring and, and retention over time, I think the work we do is incredibly important to building the culture at our company. 
Yeah, I think I'd second that. Um, for Lush, we do also annual kind of polling of why pe of people generally in the business, all across the global business, but also within North America, and really take a look at those. Um, so the, you know, our charitable giving, our charity pod, the ethical buying, the sustainability work that we do. Um, the campaigns that we run all certainly rank really high for folks about why why they're at Lush. There's some of the, there's folks here you can talk to them and ask them too. <laughs> Vikram, uh, kind of the same answer. We we it tends to track as a reason that they are interested in the company. I do think that at the end of the day we have a bit of a responsibility to say, but it is still an open marketplace of ideas. And if you are able to make a case in another direction or have another issue that you want to bring to bear to the company that you aren't seeing it focused on, then we're all ears for that too. And I think that's an important part of making sure candidates don't feel boxed out or, or yeah, disenfranchised in some capacity. Great. We're out of time. So, uh